Thank you for coming to our session. My name is Haruhiro Uchida, head of production of Mars Animation Planet. Um, today, we're going to um, show how we make the short film called Gift. And today's speakers are these three. Um, me and the director and the lead of the technical engineer. So before I show your, our film, I'm going to introduce our company. Uh, Marza is a CZ animation studio in Japan. Um, it's a part of a large media group called Sega. You can see our characters, the Sonic, um, involved in games, amusement, and toys. Up until now, we have created some several future films and various animation works. So as you know, computer graphics and games have a lot in common, but also are very different in many ways. This slide shows some of the main difference between the two. So we asked ourselves, how can we create a video production more effectively? How can we increase the productivity? When looking at these problems, real time came to our mind. Maybe it's also because of our background of being a group of a game company. As a result, we decided to launch this short story project, GIFT, in collaboration with Unity. So this is our original short story using Unity in the production process. Uh, we already showed the trailer in the keynote session in this morning. But now I'm going to show the full version here. So please take a look. working I'm not asking you to You're come up
Hello, uh, I'm Kohei Kajisen, the director of the gift. I'll explain about the gift project from the production's point of view. First is the challenge and the solution of the project. This was the producer's request to the production team. To be honest, I was very surprised um, because our company is not a game company. Only a few staff members had experience using game engine. Moreover, the time schedule was very tight. Uh, it was last August when the project information was given to the production team. At that point, I was told that story development would take until November, which means that production team has only three months before GDC. I know that's a very short time. When I shared the fact with the production staff members, they all looked so confused. Uh, to overcome the challenges, we sought out every possible option. Because we had a limited amount of time until the release at the GDC, we had to come up with an environment in which the production staff members could work without confusion. As Unity seemed to be very engineer friendly, we decided to integrate it directly into our pre-render pipeline. Additionally, we absolutely needed to automate the short work process. So we also decided to develop additional tools for Unity itself. Our next challenge was to achieve equivalent quality as pre-rendered images. However, things that we usually do with an offline render can't necessarily be achieved at the same level of quality in a real-time engine. Mostly shadow, reflection, and soft lighting. Uh, to fill the gap, we decided to rely more heavily than we initially thought on our composite workflow. Also, we realized the necessity of pursuing expressiveness in animation, including offline simulation and sculpted animation. So we decided to establish a workflow based on geometry cache. Furthermore, to achieve the desired expressiveness in the main character's look, we decided to develop our own shaders for skin, eye, and hair. A challenge of this project was also making the movie attractive as a technical demo. Uh, we considered the necessity of highlight shots in both artistic and technical aspects. I remembered the session of Unite Tokyo 2015 about drawing massive amount of objects by Mr. Ishibashi, the engineer of Unity Japan. And uh, I was interested in integrating his approach into our project. Uh, thanks to Unity Japan for arrangement, Mr. Ishibashi was in our office for a while to try this challenge together. As a result, that big web shot was created. The detail will be explained later on the technical part. Uh, here now is Gide Gaiton, our engineering supervisor for this project. Hello, my name is Gide Gaiton, and I was in charge of supervising the engineering effort for that project. So, as Kajisa said earlier, we had very limited time a uh, limited amount of time and resource for that project. So we decided to uh, reuse as most as we can what we already had in our pre-render pipeline. So here is a rough, very rough, actually, outline of our current pipeline. So I don't think uh, there is anything very special about that. It's pretty standard. Uh, I've laid out the things so that you can easily see where, what we use Unity for. So mainly look, dev, and lighting, shading, 
and lighting, basically. This, those are the parts that we would usually use a third-party renderer like Arnold or V-Ray. Uh, so we basically use Unity as a renderer, uh, just keeping the same inputs, the same outputs as we would usually have. So our pipeline, in our pipeline, we already have uh, an Alembic-based uh, geometry cache workflow. Uh, we also have our camera data that is uh, outputted in different file formats, including FBX and Alembic. So one of the first things we wanted to, to do is to be able to bring those Alembic files uh, into Unity. So uh, we didn't have any experience at all with Unity, uh, not even using, not even developing anything. So, uh, but we could get started really quickly thanks to Unity, the team, uh, the, the Japan, Japan team of Unity. So they provide us the base of the Alembic importer that they've shared on GitHub. And from there on, we, we modified to, to fit our own needs. On the shading side, though the shading was to be done uh, fully in Unity, we still had a few information that we wanted to, to extract from Maya, uh, especially uh, the shader assignments and, and the base texture that would already be assigned in Maya, I mean, the albedo texture, the roughness, etc. Uh, one more reason to have the assignments from Maya is that on the Maya side, we could as assign material on a per phase basis, but on Unity, uh, basically, if you don't have a sub mesh, you cannot assign a, a separate material on that part. So, we needed that information to kind of drive the Alembic importer to split the mesh into different submeshes so that we could assign material. So that's one of the modifications we've done on the, uh, the Alembic importer. So now we have both our geometry, camera, shaders, and all the things. Uh, what we need to, to do is actually do the, sh uh, the work, the lighting work, and output uh, the result as a series of EXR files. EXR is a uh, is a file format, is an image file format that is very used uh, in the industry, uh, movie and VFX industry. So same here, I mean, uh, Unity Japan provided us the, the base block to write uh, EXR files from rendered targets, and we've used that into our own camera component um, that, that would capture basically the game view uh, content into EXR files. Uh, we added on top of that our own system, our render pass system that would allow, you, uh, allow us to add any number of render targets. And for each of those targets, we could override the materials, override the shaders, maybe change the materials parameters, and add them or put it as, diff uh, as separate layers in the, in the main EXR sequence. Then it would be handed out to our composite team to do the final work. So with all that, we have our inputs and our inputs ready. But we still need to link that to our asset management database. Uh, that's also something that we already has in the, uh, have in the pre-render pipeline. Um, so basically, uh, this comes up as uh, the asset manager that we have for Unity. So we develop a completely new UI for that. Uh, you can see that as a, as a hub from which you can import any bit of data that you've published on the pipeline. So if you publish something in Maya, it will pop up straight away in that interface so that you can bring it in. Uh, in Unity, meaning in your, inside your scene. So we also make some kind of logical distinction between what we call short elements and assets and packages. Short elements, it, I think it, it may be a bit confusing, but short elements are basically assets that are published for a specific shot. So th that would usually be the camera, uh, the animation caches, and this kind of things. While the assets are meant to be reused all over the place. So shader, rig, uh, model, etc. Uh, we also are able to regroup those assets together into a more logical entity that we call package. So, for example, we have a, a one package for, for a character that would include maybe several bits of geometry, uh, some shaders, and maybe some additional data. So, uh, once we have all that, um, we need to get working, right? We need to build the shots in Unity. So, on our database also, we have something else that, uh, that let us register on a per shot basis what are the assets, the packages that we want to, 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 to see in, the show, uh, in that shot. So what set do we want to use? What character do we want to have? What props, etc. And we register all that in the database so we can easily uh, actually get all the data that we need, the, the specific version, etc. Uh, in a very simple way. Actually, the artist would just have to click on one button, and it will be uh, built a completely new thing from scratch. Uh, it could pull dozens of assets from our file server, copy that on the Unity project, and uh, it could actually expand to more than hundreds of files for a single shot. All, all that was done actually automatically. So once they, I, I'm, I'm going to, to probably describe a bit more what is sequence and shot, but maybe you're not familiar with that. But the movie, 
is separated into sequence. Each sequence is, um, happen is happening in a specific place. So that would be the kid room at the beginning, maybe the hill when they go they're going down. So each, each of those are a sequence. And we further subdivide the sequences in shots. Uh, each shot is a like, continuous camera movement. So for each sequence, we would usually also select one or two of what we call master shot. So basically, those are shots that are a bit representative of what we have uh, in all the sequence, uh, lighting, condition, etc. And we would start working on Zeus first, uh, refining until we get the director's approval, well, I mean Kajisa. And once we, we, we're done with that, it's approved, we, could, we would basically need to generate all the remaining shot scene files. We would have one scene file for each shot, basically. And that's what version also. Uh, but we wanted to keep all the modifications that has been done in the master shot, so including adding the light objects, modifying maybe the game components to add the attributes to, for mature overrides and all that kind of thing. So we, there, again, we come up with a little tool that does that automatically for us. And, uh, but at the root of the thing was, uh, again, uh, we, we've modified the Alembic importer to be able to update all the Alembic cache paths in one go. Uh, Again, using also our database to know what are the, 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 the new caches that we need for each, every single shot there. Uh, so we could create like dozens of shots in one click using that little tool. From there on, Artil will maybe refine further each shot because then again, each shot maybe has its specific lighting setup or modifications that you may want to add to. So with that, uh, once the artists are complete with, with, with the work on, on, on their shots, uh, or maybe when they want the director to check, check the, 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 the results, uh, we, we, we would need to capture, uh, to capture the, the result as an EXR file sequence, as I was telling you earlier. Again, uh, in itself, it was not really that slow. I think it was taking like three seconds to capture a single frame. So that makes um, uh, some five minutes to capture a, a hundred frame shot and 30 minutes for a sequence. So, and then it ends up like taking a little time. So we come up with a little tool that batch all those requests. And uh, when the artists would go out for lunch or maybe come back home in the evening, they would just like execute all this uh, in one go. So they could check that the, the day after or in the afternoon. Now I will quickly talk about the shaders we've developed uh, for that project. So uh, our, our own standard shader, uh, it's not that we, the, the Unity standard shader is bad, but we actually wanted more, more control, basically. That's mo most of the time, it's, uh, it's that. We, we wanted more control. So we have added a second set, for example, of parameters, like a second, uh, second set of albedo, roughness, et cetera, that we could blend using ma additional maps, et cetera. We also added a few things that are non-photorealistic. Um, I know that's a no-no recently. I, I hear a lot about PBR. But we're more, more concerned about what the, the final shot look, at, uh, look in the end. So uh, we, we sometimes use this kind of trick. Um, we also added double-sided shading and tessellation, all that kind of goodies. The first shader itself was, is based on a very well-known technique, I think. It was a shell te texturing. It's based on geometry shader that gradually inflates the geometry to create uh, layers of like with transparency and so forth. So pretty much all aspects of the shaders were controllable, controllable with maps, including the fur flow. We would, we would use Mary actually to paint those maps. Uh, the, uh, the, the length, the density, uh, the color of the root tip and the skin. And we will also use our own standard shader to do the, the actual shading. For the characters, uh, we have a set of skin eye hair shaders. That are all also, I think, pretty standard. Again, we wanted to have like more control, uh, m m mostly. So the skin is uh, just screen-based SSS. Uh, the eye, we use parallax mapping to get like a bit of depth in the refraction. Uh, hair shader is based on the Kajia model, which is also pretty standard. Uh, two specular lobes. We get the anisotropic effect using the Unity surface shader custom lighting model. And we also add, again, one more non-photorealistic kind of thing about the, the, the eye light in the eye. So we could control precisely the placement and the size, etc. Because uh, for us, I mean, the, the eye light gives life to the character. I mean, if you don't have that, that little cute girl would look like a dead fish. Um, we also build our own grass shader that would generate all those glass, grass blades procedurally and animate them. Um, again, a full set of maps to control density, height, et cetera, et cetera, root tip color. And we also had uh, some kind of shadow map like algorithm to kind of flatten the grass wherever the little box comes on top of it. 
I will end this, uh, my part with talking about the big wave effect. So uh, here is the first test we've done. Uh, those tests were done in, uh, in Houdini. Basically, we would generate like hundreds. Um, this test, I think, it was 10,000 balls uh, simulated in Houdini. And we would export that as an Alembic cache um, containing meshes. So we, we brought that in Unity. Uh, this is a very brute force, basically. But so far, actually, um, Unity did handle the high, a, a big amount of geometry pretty well. So we wanted to, to, to see how far we could push that at the beginning. So it was working so-so. It was correctly, not, not, not too bad to, uh, to add other standards. But the problem was that we wanted to have 100, 200 more, more balls, actually. So that wouldn't, that wouldn't work. So that's where uh, the idea of uh, reusing the, the pseudo instancing. So that's something that was presented at Unite Tokyo last year by uh, someone from Unity Japan. So the uh, basic idea, uh, I really invite you to read the presentation. It's very interesting. Uh, but the basic idea is to reduce the number of draw calls. So rather than having a single ball, uh, a mesh with a single ball, we would just combine, like, I think in, in our final scene, it was 1,500 a, a balls into a single mesh. And then in a vertex shader, we would move the balls in the right place. Uh, and, to, and where would you move the balls? Basically, this was based on the texture that was computed in a pre-pass based on the point cloud, uh, the instance point cloud. So that texture would contain all the transformation information, et cetera, the idea of the balls we want to put there, and so forth. So uh, that's when um, Mr. Shibashi from Unity Japan came to work with us uh, at Marza, and we kind of collaborate that to, to get that flow uh, working really smoothly, uh, actually modifying, all, again, the Alibic importer to, to get it really quick. So back to the flow itself. So uh, for, those, for this sequence, basically, we would start with the effects guys working in Houdini. They would generate like a, a, a bunch of patterns of different wave patterns, different speed, eight, et cetera, et cetera, and export that as simple mesh, very low res, to be handed out to the layout guys. The layout guys, depending on the shot on the camera movement they wanted to have, would select among those patterns only one pattern. And uh, once they settled on that, we could start doing the animation of the remaining parts of the scene, like the little girl and the raft on top of it, in this example. At the same time, the, the, the pattern that they wanted to use was sent back to, to the, the FX team that was still using Udini to create a super high-res uh, version of the mesh and scatter points on top of the surface. Finally, they would all put that into an Alembic file. And because of the integration work we've done before with, uh, with Mr. Shibashi of uh, Unity Japan, we could just bring it straight away into Unity. The only thing left we had to do then would be to probably adjust the size of the ball, the shadings. Maybe I had a few more balls here and there, because point was cut on the surface of the wave. So actually, depending on the camera angle, you could see through the wave. So we wanted to add more balls, yet, yet more balls inside the wave. So that's kind of little details, and, and of course the lighting. So I will end up with showing you uh, a little video of uh, how it worked inside Unity. So to our standard, this is really, really fast, actually. <laughs> uh, it, but it's not, I wouldn't say it's, uh, it's fast to real-time standard. That was 500, uh, fi 5 FPS on a GTX uh, 980. Uh, you don't see the wave moving there, because this is what's taking time. We're streaming a, like a huge point cloud from an Arabic file and the geometry and all the kind of stuff. So, but as long as you stay on a static frame, I, I, actually, I think it was like really pretty smooth. And we could even like change the light and see the FX directly in the viewport, which for us was quite novel, because usually at that stage uh, in the movie making, basically, uh, the Maya scene, we only have bonding box. Uh, they are empty bonding box, because we want to have a like, super light scene. And even if we had that much geometry in the viewport, actually, that wouldn't make sense, because we render with some, some, something different. In Unity, what we see in the viewport was what we had in the render. So that was really interesting to see. I think that's all I will have the time to say to you today. So thank you for your attention. Uh, as I conclude our presentation, I would like to summarize the main points. Oh, Haru? You got the delay. Uh, just a moment. Here you go.
So Real's fights are not showing up in the screen. I don't know whose fight it is. It's, uh, oh, it's coming. It's, it came out. Oh, all right, okay. all right. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a diagram of the component of the gift. Upper half is an engineering component that the Gita has just explained. Uh, and the lower half is a film picture making know how that the mother originally had. We believe that the successful combination of both was a key to achieving a high quality to the gift. Uh, let's take a look back at the overall process uh, by images. Uh, this is a story reel thumbnail. Uh, following is a color script. This is the layout. And this is the production art. Uh, these are the final images. Uh, we believe the combination of the film picture making know-how and the engineering that we achieved enabled the completion of the gift. Uh, I will once again show the challenges that we had to overcome. Uh, it was very difficult, uh, but uh, we are here today to prove that we have been quite successful. Uh, based on our experience, uh, we hope to offer more beautiful and more enjoyable stories to you. Uh, finally, extra. Uh, we released the asset data of Portado, including first shader at the URL below. Uh, it is free, uh, really free. Uh, please feel free to download and play with it. Uh, thank you for listening. <laughs>